Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, welcome to The Briefing. My name is Gloria DiPiero. Later this hour, we'll hear live from Merseyside Police to get the latest on the tragic shooting of the nine-year-old Liverpool uh, girl, which happened last night. If Liz Truss becomes Prime Minister, she will announce measures to Parliament about how she'll deal with the cost of living, but there won't be any economic forecast. Why not? We'll speak to one of her supporters. And why are thousands of BTEC students still waiting for their results? We will ask Labour's education spokesperson all that after your news. Good afternoon, it's one minute past 12. I'm Bethany Elsie here to bring you up to date from the GB newsroom. A nine-year-old girl has been shot dead at a home in Liverpool. Officers were called to a house in the Notty Ash area last night after reports that an unknown man fired a gun inside. The child was shot in the chest and later died in hospital. Two others, a man and a woman, are in hospital with gunshot injuries. The local MP, Ian Byrne, has described the incident as heartbreaking. He tweeted to say our communities deserve better and our children deserve better. A record number of migrants have crossed the English Channel in a single day. Nearly 1,300 were detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross the UK in the back of lorries also continues to be an ongoing problem. In the past year, official figures reveal around 8,000 people were detected at UK ports having illegally crossed the Channel. Former President Donald Trump is asking a judge to halt the FBI's review of documents taken from his home earlier this month. He's now suing the Justice Department over its investigation into whether he mishandled classified material by taking documents from the White House after he left office. Local media says the US government collected more than 300 restricted files from Mr Trump's home in Florida. Trump's legal team is demanding that an independent lawyer is appointed to oversee the review. Industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director, Felipe Comare, is warning that half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January, when energy prices could reach £4,600. Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak says he'll do all he can to support those who need it most. I cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn winter, and I know things are difficult, and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. 
Meanwhile, Liz Truss says she will put the West Midlands at the heart of her economic revival if she becomes Prime Minister. Ahead of the Conservative Party hustings in Birmingham tonight, Ms Truss revealed her plan to support businesses through lower taxes. She also pledged to deliver infrastructure projects, including the Midlands Rail Hub. The Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab, is accusing striking barristers of holding justice to ransom after they voted for industrial action. Members of the Criminal Bar Association in England and Wales will stage an indefinite and uninterrupted strike next month. They're demanding better pay and legal aid funding. The government has offered a 15% pay increase, but the CBA says it only covers new cases and won't start immediately. While well, criminal barrister Zaid Ahmed told GB News it's not good enough. I do it for justice, for, for, the, for those uh, uh, defenders and victims who come to court and who can have their say so that they can move on with their life. That's why I do it. I didn't come into this job to make money, uh, but I need to make money in order to survive and to be able to continue to do the job. And it's a shame that the, the Justice Secretary can't recognise that. More than a dozen EasyJet flights in and out of Gatwick Airport have been suddenly cancelled due to staff illness. The airport says they called off 26 flights, with most of the staff shortages happening in its air traffic control tower. Only hours earlier, the boss at Gatwick had reported that it was business as usual at the airport, following months of strain. Meanwhile, thousands of short-haul British Airways flights are being cancelled between the end of October and March next year. Dozens of flights a day are already cancelled over the next two months. It's after Heathrow Airport has extended its 100,000 daily passenger limit due to staff shortages and a lower-than-expected demand over the winter. And the number of deaths that occurred during some of the hottest days in July were higher than average than on any other day in the month. Official figures show a 7% increase in the number of deaths on a day which saw extremely hot weather. Figures peaked at 1,775 on the 19th of July, the day that Britain recorded temperatures of over 40 degrees Celsius. You're watching GB News. We'll have more news as it happens. Now let's get back to Gloria. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, the latest on that fatal shooting of a nine-year-old girl in Liverpool. Police are expected to give a statement in the next half hour. We'll bring you that live. Liz Truss, our likely next Prime Minister, has you turned on her plans to hold an emergency cost of living budget? Any help she now announces won't have to reveal her sums. We'll ask one of her backers why. And speaking of homework marking, thousands of students have been left in limbo, still waiting for their BTEC results, causing uncertainty over their futures. I'll talk to Shadow Education Minister Toby Perkins. Give me your political briefing, send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. A manhunt has been launched after a nine-year-old girl was shot dead in Liverpool. A man and a woman were also injured at a house in the Notty Ash area of the city. GB News North West reporter Sophia Reaper has been following the story closely since it broke last night. She sent us this update. 10 p.m. last night, police were called to this street behind us after reports that a man had fired a gun at one of the properties. When police arrived at the scene, they found a nine-year-old girl with a gunshot wound to her chest. She was rushed to hospital, but sadly later died from her injuries. We also know that a man received a gunshot wound to his body and a woman a gunshot wound to her hand. They're now being treated for their injuries in hospital. Merseyside police have said a murder investigation is now underway and that they'll be using CCTV, forensic and door-to-door -door inquiries to help them get to the bottom of this. In a statement from Merseyside Police, Assistant Chief Constable Jenny Sims said, our thoughts and condolences go to her family and friends at this very difficult time. No parent should ever have to suffer the loss of a child in these dreadful circumstances. This crime is abhorrent and our communities must come forward and tell us who is responsible. We're carrying out a number of lines of inquiry as a matter of urgency and would ask for dashcam, CCTV or mobile 
mobile phone footage from anyone who lives, works or was visiting the area of Kings Heath Avenue last night. Now, so far, scientific support, otherwise known as forensics, have arrived at the street to continue this murder investigation. And we've been speaking to some of the local residents this morning and they've told us that this is a very tight-knit community and that they're going to do what it takes to find the man responsible. There's a lot of understanding of grass culture here in this area of the country, but local residents have told us that that is now out of the window. They will do what it takes. There is a press conference expected later on today in Liverpool at Merseyside Police HQ, and we're going to be bringing you all the latest from that conference. Sophie Reaper reporting for us there, and as she said, we expect to hear live from Merseyside Police in about 20 minutes or so. Now... Rishi Sunak has played down suggestions of accepting a job in Liz Truss's cabinet if she becomes Prime Minister, saying he would need to agree with the big things in her policy platform. The former Chancellor has been deeply critical of her tax and spending platform, and late last night, Ms Truss appeared to U-turn on her plan to hold an emergency budget to address the cost of living crisis. Well, let's now speak to Tom Hunt, Conservative MP for Ipswich, who is backing Liz Truss. Uh, Tom, always good to see you on the show. Welcome. Tom, I'm going to be asking you about that supposed U-turn by Liz Truss, but first of all, the big story of the day, the most abhorrent story, your reaction to the tragic events in Liverpool? Um, yes, very, very, very shocking. Um, you know, it, it, terrible thing what's happened there. Um, so my thoughts are with, you know, the family and friends of that individual, and we need to find out what's happened um, as soon as possible, but very disturbed by it, like everybody else in the country. OK. Uh, let's talk about uh, Liz Truss, who you are backing to be our next Prime Minister. She is the clear favourite. Now, we know she's planning to reduce taxes, but the poorest in our society don't pay taxes. So how is she going to help those most in need? I think um, Liz Truss has um, I, it's made it pretty clear that I think that there is going to be some further support announced for those on the lowest incomes. Obviously, you know, her a key priority for her is cutting taxes. She said she's going to do that from day one. That will help many people. But then in addition to that, I think there will be some more targeted support for those who need the help the most. Um, and and I, I, from what I've heard, I think that's going to be quite focused on those who are in, in the most need of help. Um, but, you know, we've got the highest tax burden we've had for 70 odd years, having a Conservative leader, having a Conservative Prime Minister who's deeply uncomfortable with that, wants to rectify that and cut taxes so we can keep as much money in our pockets as, as we can, particularly at a time where, we, where it's going to be a struggle for most people, I think is a, is a, is a good objective. It's uh, been a fairly bruising contest, still a couple of weeks uh, to go almost. Um, I want to quote Michael Gove, your colleague, uh, senior politician, former senior cabinet minister. He says the proposed cuts to national insurance, ins national insurance would favour the wealthy and changes to corporation tax apply to big businesses. His point is that her plans favour the wealthy and FTSE 100 executive. Um, I really... I... On corporation tax, I really haven't agreed with how that's been characterised by by certain individuals. You know, this is you know, yes, we've got you know we've got inflation at, at, at unprecedented levels. That is a key worry, as a real worry. But we've also got the possibility of just meandering into some kind of deep recession that we need to try and avoid. And it seems to me that when you're potentially on the precipice of a deep recession, whacking up corporation tax by about six or seven points is not a wise thing to do. It wouldn't be a good thing for economic growth. And ultimately, economic growth, is, it's, not just, it's not about the wealthy. It is actually about helping the whole country, about providing jobs, investment. Uh, so I, I haven't agreed with a way that, that you know, and, and I must also say you know, that on, on corporation tax, it's not cutting corporation tax, it's just not rising it as a time where we've got a threat of a recession, which to me seems like a very wise thing to do. In terms of the national insurance, um, uh, the national insurance, not, um, you know, but there's many, many people who will benefit from, you know, um, not, not going ahead with increasing national insurance, who I, I wouldn't describe as being the most wealthy. But as I've said, as I said as well before, I think in addition to those, um, those changes on tax strategy, I also think there's going to be some additional help. But that help is going to be focused on those who really need it and those who really need it the most. Not give, have a situation where we take more in tax and then give everyone, whether they need it or not, some kind of extra payment. Okay. Um, which is what the Labour Party is proposing for our energy price freeze. OK, whatever spending commitments she decides to make, 
Isn't it important that we see the state of the economy? But Liz Truss, uh, we understand, has declined the offer from the government's economic watchdog to provide her, and all of us, with the economic forecasts which would inform her thinking. W why has she done that? Um, I have to, I think this debate about whether something is technically called a budget or a fiscal event, I think is a little bit of a red herring. I think the key thing is that we get a new prime minister in as soon as possible, preferably Liz Trust for me, as, as you know, I'm a backer, and that we get an outline of what further support is going to be provided to help people through an incredibly difficult period. So frankly, whether that is called a fiscal event, but not a budget or a budget, I, don't, I, think, I think the key thing will be the measures in that speech and how they help people. Um, and in, in terms of the Office of Budget Responsibility, you know, on the one hand, rightly, we're getting many members of the public who think this leadership contest is going on too long. They're very concerned about the autumn and the winter. They want the government to, to get on with it and announce what they're going to do. Um, but, then, and, but my fear is that actually if we went down this Office of Budget Responsibility, it could actually delay uh, delay the time and, and take longer for the government to come forward with that additional help that it could be providing. So for me, the key thing is whether we call it a budget or fiscal event, we can call it what we want to call it. But, you know, we do want to know more soon about what further support the government's going to provide to help people for a very difficult period. Uh, so I, I don't have any great concerns about that. There will be a budget in the not too distant future. But in the short term, what we really need is, you know, some, some more clarity from whoever the new prime minister is. And, you know, my view is I think it is fair to say that the leadership contest has probably gone on a bit too long. I think there's been 12 hustings. I think it probably could have been five or six. You know, I probably should ideally would have been over by now. But ultimately, you know, if we get somebody who comes in early next month and provides that support that people need, who cuts taxes, I think, and gets people through a very difficult time and is there for people, I think that's what people will remember. And I think I'll probably be prepared to look a bit um, past the slightly irritating and um, leadership contest that has gone on for a little bit too long, in my view. Tom Hunt, always great to have you on the show. Speak to you soon. Well, the former Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has been speaking this morning. Here he is. Well, as Chancellor, I introduced a windfall tax on the energy companies because I believe that is the fair and right thing to do in these circumstances. And I announced support for people this autumn and winter. But the situation has got worse since then. So as Prime Minister, I would go further. I'd cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone. But I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn and winter. And I know things are difficult and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. Well, I've set out a clear framework for how to provide that support. I would cut VAT off energy bills to coincide with the increase in the price cap. That's something we can do very quickly. But beyond that, for two groups of people, for pensioners and for those on the lowest incomes, I will make sure that they get direct extra financial support over the autumn and winter to help them with those bills, because I know this is the number one concern people have. My, and my approach is the right one. It provides direct help to the most vulnerable in our society and doesn't do things that risk making the situation worse and actually permanent tax cuts funded by borrowing may sound attractive but if they stoke inflation and do nothing to help these groups of people who I know need help then actually no one benefits from that and, and that's why I think my plan is the right one my approach is the right one and as Prime Minister I can deliver that for the British people. Rishi Sunak speaking this morning our economics and business editor Liam Halligan is here. Um, Liam, Liz Truss is coming up for a bit of stick, coming in for a bit of stick today. She's going to make an announcement to Parliament. She's clearly going to make some announcements, if she succeeds, of course, uh, to become our next Prime Minister to help with the cost of living. But she won't produce those economic forecasts that we would normally associate with spending commitments, you know, sort of to see the state of the economy to inform her thinking and check whether it's affordable. Do we smell a rat here? Um... Crikey, this economic, lead, this Tory leadership contest is going on and on and on. Still lots of hustings to go, still two more weeks. I think a lot of people thought Rishi Sunak would have bowed out by now because there is mounting concern. The government needs to get back in the saddle, start to you know, unveil a, an assistance package given spiralling energy costs. We've got the new off-gem energy price cap coming in on mm. Friday, which yeah. is going to be eye-watering. It's going to shock a lot of people. And yet this contest goes on and the sort of centrepiece of the tussle, the increasingly bitter tussle, I must say, between Sunak's camp and Liz Truss's team. No chance of him 
taking a place in her cabinet, I think. The centrepiece of the tussle between them over the last 24 hours has been whether or not Liz Truss, if and when she becomes Prime Minister, it looks likely, when she does her emergency budget, will she accept forecasts from the Independent Office of Budget Responsibility? Now, this is something that George Osborne set up when he was Chancellor, to his credit, in my view. Um, it's an independent authority, distance from government and the Treasury, crucially. Mm. It still has the imprimatur of the civil service and it's well-resourced, but it comes up with um, forecasts within which the Chancellor, the Prime Minister, must make their fiscal pledges of spending, uh, taxation projections and so on. So it's a way of stopping politicians to the extent that they do, and they always do, over-promising in terms of spending and overestimating tax revenues when those tax revenues won't actually come to pass. And Liz Truss, Liz Truss's people are saying, because there's so little time, because this is so desperate now, there's, we don't need these Office for Budget Responsibility projections. But they, though, they've said, they've said they could produce the them. The saying, but, we, but we can produce them. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's... Um, I think that that might stick, a bit, bit more criticism. I, I think... I, you know, I, don't, I don't wish the incoming government ill at all. You know, Britain is in a difficult position. I desperately want Britain to succeed, as, as we both do. But I think, you know, financial markets, currency markets may think, hang about, yeah, you're running the fourth, fifth biggest economy in the world here. You've got an institution that is you know, reputable, the OBR. It used to be run by a guy called Robert Choate, who before that ran the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Um, again, a, a, that's not a government think tank, but it's a very, very highly regarded uh, independent think tank, a model for independent fiscal think tanks around the world, the IFS. So the OBR is respected. It's not seen as overtly political. And Liz Truss's team are saying, look, we don't need those forecasts. We're just going to go for it. Does Labour have the simplest solution? It certainly sounds simple, doesn't it? Energy bills will not go up if, if they're under a Labour government. It's, it's, is it too good to be true? It, it is, I'm afraid, with all respect. It sounds good and, you know, the, 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 the man and woman in the street will say, oh, it clearly seems to make sense. You can't just wish away wholesale energy prices. You know, wholesale energy prices, as I'll be explaining more... In my show, On The Money, after 1pm, they went up 10% yesterday alone. They're up 45% in August alone. Wholesale energy prices in Western Europe, wholesale gas prices, are at record highs. That's going to push up the price at which electricity companies, the electricity retailers, sell, you know, buy the energy. They then sell it to us in our homes, but that price is capped, and that's why so many of them are going bust. No-one wants to put them off gem energy price cap up, but that's why it's happening. So in the end, you have to pay for that. You know, com countries aren't... Energy exporters aren't going to give the gas away. So someone has to pay. You can't just keep prices where they are because then we just won't get the gas and you'll have blackouts. I think there is merit in what Labour said. I certainly congratulate Keir Starmer. Finally, you know, it took him weeks, in my view, to say something substantive. He set the ball rolling. I personally think it will be some kind of... Um, system that spreads out payments over months and years to come, mm -hmm. a combination of government assistance and household assistance. One final point, that the energy price cap, even though it keeps rising, it offers some protection, no protection at all for businesses, not least the heavy energy-using manufacturers in lots of those red wall seats. Absolutely. Liam Halligan, as ever, thank you for your expertise. Coming up, I'll be speaking with Shadow Education Minister Toby Perkins about the delays to BTEC results. Before that, it's time for a short break. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation, 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Last Thursday, hundreds of thousands of students received A-level, BTEC and T-level results. However, there are still thousands of students who have been left in limbo without their BTEC results. College leaders have demanded the exam regulator investigate the causes of this delay, with students awaiting their BTECs delivered by the exam board Pearson, who are still unable to sort the next steps in university training or employment. Well, now, let's now speak to Shadow Education Minister Toby Perkins. Toby... Good to see you. Um, I'm really keen on talking about this story. I think it's been underreported in the media. But I just want to ask you, first of all, the news that we all woke up to, the shocking news of the nine-year-old girl who was shot in Liverpool last night. A tragic but isolated incident or a sign of wider societal malaise? What do you think? Well, I think it's very difficult for me to say in this particular case. Obviously, there's been a number of um, murders in the Merseyside area in recent uh, weeks, and, and I've no doubt police are, are taking uh, very great interest in that and uh, doing all they can to bring this uh, rash of violence to an end and, and also to uh, reassure the community. Uh, I think that there has maybe been a history in the past of um, people within those kind of environments never wanting to speak to the police. I think the shock that's been felt at a nine-year-old child's life being taken in these brutal, this brutal fashion, and parents understand the shock also, um, may hopefully uh, mean that people do come through and do speak to the police and, and do finger the, the people responsible because uh, these people don't need to be on our streets. They need to be locked away for a very long time indeed. Um, so the, the extent to which this murder and the other ones which have, have shocked us all um, are are part of a, a wider societal malaise, I, I think that's maybe a question for tomorrow. I think right now what we need to do is, is end the uh, cycle of violence that we've seen there uh, and ensure that the community feels safe once again. OK, thanks for that. And, of course, we will bring uh, live the police statement in Merseyside, which we expect shortly. Uh, right, on to BTEX. Just tell us about the impact that on those people who haven't received their BTEC results, what impact is it having on their plans, on their lives? Well, I mean, it's having a very significant impact because clearly if they are wanting to go to university, they're unable to um, claim those places. Many people um, access university through the clearing system um, and until you have a result, you, you aren't at the front of the queue. So there are there are realistic cases now where people are being able to, to effectively secure their university place on the back of the clearing system because they've got their A-level results. But those BTEC students who haven't yet got them aren't able to, to have the same opportunity. So there's a real fear that BTEC students will fall behind as a result of that. Um, I think more broadly, you know, we've all had that experience of waiting for exam results and many of us as parents know what it's like having a, 
a child who's waiting for exam results, it's a desperately tense time anyway. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing worse than waking up Thursday morning expecting to get that result. And five days later, you're still waiting for that result. Pearson's and the government, I think, have been totally inadequate in terms of telling us the scale of this problem uh, and, and clearly resolving it. Now, the exam body responsible say this is affecting less than 1% of BTEC students, so 99% have got their results. Does that calm you down, hearing that those figures, those statistics? Well, I mean, ever since Thursday, um, Pearsons have been very reluctant to share exact numbers as to how many are waiting. Um, I think that um, since the, I'm told that since Thursday, an extra 4,000 results have been given out. If, if that's anything like correct, that's actually quite a bit more than 1% of the number of students who do level three qualifications. There's a lot of people in the system who are unable to access their results. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, firstly, what we need is clarity, exactly how many are that are still waiting now. Secondly, we need to know why uh, are we in this position? And thirdly, we need to know uh, when did the government know about this and what actions are they taking to actually protect the futures of those children who potentially are missing out on university places right now? Yeah, it must be incredibly difficult if you are one of those affected students. Um, imagine if this was A-levels. You can't help thinking that this would have received much wider attention. And that is because there are still some sections in our society who sneer, frankly, at BTEC qualifications. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Well, I think that um, I, I share your view, certainly, that uh, there would have been far more publicity about this uh, if it was A-levels. I think, you know, um, people in positions of power are more used to, to people pursuing the A-level route, going to university. My own son um, did a BTEC uh, and has subsequently got an excellent um, degree at university. I don't think he'd have done that without BTEC. So I, I'm a massive supporter of the vocational route. Um, but I think you are right. There is a, a society um issue with people looking down at the vocational qualifications um and we've seen all other complaints about t-levels just in the last 24 hours with with people saying that the t-level exam they did paid very little uh, attention to what they've been taught in the year up to that so now the t-levels are very uh, new qualification, the BTEC's an established one. We do need to make sure that there is the same focus being paid to the futures of people doing vocational qualifications as those doing A-levels, because they're absolutely crucial to the future of our country at a time when we have massive skill shortages. Do you think it was a mistake of the last Labour government to try to get 50% of young people to university? Was that the wrong emphasis? given that we have taken our I, don't. I, I think that many people who do BTECs go on to university. I don't. I think this sort of false divide between uh, an academic route of A-levels and a vocational route of being secondary, I think that's the, the real problem. I think we need to have a strong plan for everyone who isn't part of that 50% going to university. I don't think that the problem is that we recognised um, 10 years ago, and it's even more the case now, um, that in a, a very digital era, um, the opportunities for people People who aren't, who don't have a strong education behind them, uh, are going to be increasingly difficult. But we, we absolutely should have the same prestige for people who have a trade, who have a, uh, a qualification that is more vocational um, than, than those who are using a, a pen or a calculator. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there needs to be a recognition about the value of all of these things, not dumbing down uh, our aspirations for, for those who go to university, but to absolutely recognise that we need everyone to be as educated as the very best level that they can be if we're going to be competitive as a country. So the regulator has made a mistake. It would have happened to whoever was in government. So we can't really do anything to make sure it doesn't happen again, can we? I think that, I mean, the first thing I think we need to know is when were the government first aware of this? Um, clearly, the work should have been sent in for these qualifications several weeks ago. So, you know, at, at what point was there an awareness that there was likely to be a problem? This, they didn't just wake up Thursday morning suddenly discovering there were some results they haven't got. They will have known. So, so when did the government know and, and when did Pearson's know? Secondly, in terms of the clarity about those numbers, that's where I think government could have stepped in and said, right, this is exactly how many are there. These are the instructions we're giving to universities. These are the steps that we're going to take to make sure students don't miss out. Uh, I think that's where people kind of expected the government to have made a step, rather than necessarily saying it's the government's fault this happened in the first place.
Um, final question to you on uh, a potential Liz Truss premiership. Uh, she didn't enter the contest as a favourite. She's pretty much destroyed Rishi Sunak. What's to say she's not going to destroy Keir Starmer? Well, um, the electorate that elects the Conservative Party leader and the electorate that elects the Prime Minister are very, very different groups of people. So I think that um, my, the experience I've had here in Chesterfield um, is that people are pretty alarmed by the idea of a trust premiership. Um, it will be for her to prove whether she's up to the task. We're writing Rishi Sunak off. We haven't actually seen the result yet. Let's, let's see what it is. Um, but I think that uh, uh, the conversation you were having just a few moments ago about her saying, well, I'd like to put financial plans through without the inconvenience of uh, uh, of having the OBR look at them. When you recognise the huge credibility gap that she's going to face when she starts, she may overcome that, but she's immediately going to be taking over that job with with a huge questions about her credibility. That Those aren't going to be given uh, any reassurance um, by those kind of comments from her. So uh, electorally, I'm pretty confident about facing Liz Truss, um, but for the sake of our country, we need her to do some kind of competent job because we're in a very, very different difficult position as a country right now. My constituents are experiencing it and we need a government to take serious action. Shadow Education Minister Toby Perkins, live from Chesterfield. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Coming up, I'll be speaking with former Conservative advisor James Starkey and former Ed Miliband advisor Tom Hamilton. First, it's your news. Gloria, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 12.34. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. A nine-year-old girl has been shot dead at a home in Liverpool. Officers were called to a house in the Notley Ash area last night after reports that an unknown man fired a gun inside. The child was shot in the chest and later died in hospital. Two others, a man and a woman, are in hospital with injuries. Police say they're still searching for the gunman. A record number of migrants have crossed the Channel in a single day as nearly 1,300 were detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of lorries continues to be an ongoing problem. In the past year, official figures reveal around 8,000 people were detected at UK ports having illegally crossed the English Channel. Industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director, Philippe Comare, is warning that half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January when the energy prices are expected to reach £4,600. Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak says he'll do all he can to support those that need it most cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn winter, and I know things are difficult, and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. Meanwhile, Liz Truss says she will put the West Midlands at the heart of her economic revival if she becomes Prime Minister. Ahead of the Conservative Party hustings in Birmingham tonight, Ms Truss revealed her plan to support businesses through lower taxes. She's also pledged to deliver infrastructure projects, including the Midlands Rail Hub. You're watching GB News on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Well, now it's time to get back to Gloria. Just to let you know, we are still waiting for that live press conference from Merseyside Police. And as soon as that happens, we will take you straight there. But for now, let's turn our attention back to the Conservative leadership race. As reports suggest that Liz Truss has backtracked over plans to hold an emergency budget if she becomes Prime Minister and will instead hold a watered-down fiscal event. It will still include plans to reverse the national insurance rise, but will avoid the need for the four days of parliamentary debate required for budget resolutions. Well, joining me now, two brilliant former political advisor, former Labour advisor Tom Hamilton and former Conservative advisor James Starkey. Uh, good to see you, gentlemen. If I may, I'd like to start by asking you about the story of today. And I'll start with you, James, if I may, because you're a former government advisor. The nine-year-old girl who was shot in Liverpool last night why aren't politicians talking about this? Why isn't the Home Secretary everywhere, the Prime Minister? Should they be talking about it, is my question to you, James. Yeah, I think, you know, more people will want to hear 
about what's going to be done about it. It's certainly the case that actually large amounts, a lot, a lot of lots of parts of crime are down over the past few years, but homicide is up. And these kinds of stories, particularly the horrific one that we've heard today, um, and rightly, people affects people more deeply when it's and when it's a young child. You know, people will want to hear from politicians about what they're going to do about that. Tom, are you surprised that, I mean, we haven't heard from Keir Starmer either or the Shadow Home Secretary, uh, uh, Yvette Cooper, should we be hearing from them? It'll be what everyone was talking about over their breakfast cereal this morning. It will be, because it's such a, a shocking story. I think the, the, the local MPs have spoken about it. I have seen, um, I think Keir Starmer's tweeted about it. I'm not sure if he's said anything um, um, sort of out loud on, on broadcast. I think the, the issue is that beyond saying this is a budget, and we want to see um, whoever it brought it. We don't know very much about it. It is an open, an open case, and I think there are limits to what politicians can say beyond showing their solidarity with, with the family and the community and expressing their horror. And that's the right thing for politicians to do. But I'm not sure what else they can do at this point. There's certainly it's certainly too early to think about sort of policy responses to it because you just don't know enough about what's happened. It's possible that might happen in the future, but I don't think we're there yet. OK. OK, let's look at the Conservative leadership contest and who is going to be our next Prime Minister. James, let's say Liz Truss emerges victorious in a couple of weeks' time. She is our new Prime Minister. You're, you have her ear. You are advising her. How does she take down Keir Starmer in a way that arguably she's taken down Rishi Sunak? <laughs> Well, I, I think that she doesn't need to think like that. It's not about taking down Keir Starmer. I think Labour have obviously set the agenda over the past week or so with their energy policy in what's been a bit of a vacuum kind of in government terms. I'd accept that. But when you're the government, you need to lead. And the way to kind of take on Starmer is to get on the front foot. It's then for Starmer to respond to the government. So my advice would be, um, you know, she's going to need a big, bold plan on energy. What's currently proposed, I think everyone knows, won't be enough. So there'll be something on that. They've obviously hinted at that, and they're talking about this fiscal event um, in the coming weeks. And beyond that, to focus on delivery, to focus on the promises that we made to people in 2019. They will need to be delivered upon over the next 18 months. If you do that, you will set the agenda, and you won't need to think about taking on Starmer. Starmer will have to think about how does he react to that. Mm, OK, sensible advice. Uh, Tom, if you're advising Keir Starmer about how to deal with a fresh, a new Liz Truss premiership, what would you be saying to him? I think the, the, the main thing is to sort of to, to hold your nerve. I think it's quite easy to see ways in which Liz Truss will have a, a, a new approach that might come across quite well with some people. She'll be a new face. I can see the Conservatives having at least a, at least a small bounce in the polls. It's early to say what, what will happen, but it's certainly not impossible. I think what we really need to sort of hold on to is that the success or failure of the Liz Trust Premiership will be all about policy. She's made some really big calls on what she wants to do on policy, some quite big tax cuts, which um, which I think, and I think that the Labour Party would think are not quite the right way of dealing with the, the really big um, cost of living problems coming down track because they're not particularly well targeted at the people who will be suffering most from those. If she sticks to those policies, those policies, she's making a really big bet. The question is, oh. with the personal budgets, and then getting the growth that Liz Truss says, as we all want, that she that, that she wants to see. And um, if her policies work, that's clearly a problem for, for for the Labour Party and a good thing for for the country, I guess, because because it will it will mean economic growth and a, and a solution to the problem. I think that's quite unlikely to happen. So what Starmer needs to do is to continue to say what he what he is saying about the need to step in and give people a lot more help than, than is currently being given with their energy bills, especially as we're going to the autumn and winter and people starting to put the heating on a lot more than they are at the moment. Um, so I would say stick roughly to the message that's been that's been put out. Respond to events as they come, but don't panic about the fact that, um, that the Prime Minister is a bit different from the one we've got at the moment. OK, thank you, uh, Tom Hamilton. Uh, back to our former government adviser, James Starkey. We've got a summer of strikes. We're inevitably going to have an autumn of strikes and we're probably going to have a winter of strikes. I'm not sure either party has quite got their uh, response to this right. Um, James, could your party, the governing party, do better 
at responding and stopping these strikes? I mean, I think they're going to have to. I think, you know, we've got uh, waves with the inflation. We're going to have waves of threatened strikes across various sectors. It's going to be a big issue, something that uh, politicians probably haven't faced for a very long time on this scale. Uh, it's normally been isolated to kind of, you know, specific sectors. So I think, you know, for both parties, it's clearly been a challenge. You know, it's been a challenge from the government to hold their line. It's been a challenge for Labour to battle with, you know, their movement and whether it's right or wrong to be on the picket line. So I think both parties have found it difficult because, look, this is an incredibly difficult political situation. You know, for many people, bills are rising fast. They can't afford them. They're wanting to see that reflected in pay. The government at the same time is having to work out how to do that and still rein in spending. So I think this is only going to get more challenging. And in terms of what I mentioned earlier about delivery, this is going to be another big challenge that the government and the Labour Party, in terms of how they approach this, faces over the next kind of six months or so. Oh, sorry. Tom, question to you. I'm not sure Labour have got it right on strikes either. Should they do better? Would you, would you advise them to do things differently on strike response? Well, it's clearly um, it's clearly caused them some problems um, with uh, with issues about uh, shadow ministers joining picket lines and so on. I think the problem for oppositions always is that oppositions can't do anything. All they can do is is talk. And Labour, as a party that aspires to be in government, that aspires to be on the I guess the other side of some of these industrial disputes, um, you know, it might take a different approach from the government, but it wants to be the negotiating party. It's very difficult for it to say um, quite simply that it's, it's it's on the side of what they want to be the other side in the, in, in in those negotiations. I think what they can do is express um, you know, solidarity with the demand that workers have for, 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 for higher wages, because that's something that I think a lot of people across the economy see, and just um, criticise the, the, the government for, for failing to do, to do more. And um, what it can't do is just endorse absolutely every demand that all unions make, and that's not its job. Its job is to, to be broadly on that side, but not get into the specifics. And it's all, that's always a problem for it. But I don't, I don't think that its overall approach is I'm wrong. going to interrupt you now because that we're going to cross live. Thank you so much. We're going to cross live to Liverpool, where the police are giving a news conference. Nine -year -old yesterday. I'm going to hand you over to Chief Constable Serena Kennedy and Detective Chief Superintendent Mark Camino, who's our Head of Investigations. Good afternoon. A nine-year-old girl who we can name today as Olivia Pratt Corbell has died following a shooting in Dovecot last night, Monday the 22nd of August. And her family are absolutely devastated, inconsolable and heartbroken. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. The people of Liverpool and Merseyside are known for their compassion and pulling together in times of crisis. And I know that our communities, people are wanting to help the family in any way possible. This is not the time for anyone who knows who is responsible for this shooting to remain tight-lipped. It is time for our communities to come together with us and make Merseyside a place where the use of guns on our streets is totally unacceptable and those who use them are held to account. Our thoughts and condolences are with Olivia's family who have been torn apart no mum, no dad, no sister or brother should ever have to experience loss in this way. Poignantly, Olivia was killed on the 15th anniversary of the murder of Rhys Jones. His murder should have been a watershed moment in the battle against gun crime and the use of guns on our streets. But shockingly, there are still callous criminals who are prepared to use weapons on our streets and have utter disregard for the heartache and the pain that they have caused to Olivia's family. 
Olivia's family are the third family who've lost a loved one in the past week through gun crime, following the tragic murders of Sam River and Ashley Dale. Our thoughts very much remain with their families and the investigations continue into their murders. At 10pm last night, our officers were called to Olivia's home on Kings Heath Avenue. And when we arrived, we found three people had been injured, including Olivia and her mum. It is believed that one of the injured parties, a 35-year-old man, was being chased by a man armed with a gun who was firing at him. The man being chased forced his way into Olivia's house and the offender ran in after him, firing a number of shots with complete disregard for Olivia and her family, who had no connection with the gunman or the man who forced his way in. Sadly, Olivia was fatally wounded when the gunman fired at the man who was trying to get into the house, and her mum also suffered a gunshot to her wrist. The 35-year-old man had been chased suffered a number of gunshots to his upper body. Whilst Olivia lay dying, he was picked up by his friends who took him to hospital. On arrival, our officers could see just how poorly Olivia was and they rushed her to Alderhay Children's Hospital where despite the best efforts of medical staff, she sadly died and her mum was taken to hospital by colleagues from the Northwest Ambulance Service. This is a shocking and appalling attack which will reverberate around our communities. And I want to take this opportunity again to appeal to anybody who knows who is responsible for this attack to please come forward and give us those names. We need to find all who are responsible for this, not just the gunman, we need to find out who supplied the weapon and who arranged this terrible incident. Forensic experts are at the scene at this moment in time, conducting house-to-house -house inquiries have taken place and officers are reviewing CCTV footage to establish and identify who is responsible. We will not rest until those who are responsible are put behind bars. I can guarantee that no stone will be left unturned. I recognise how incredibly frightening this is for our communities, as well as, as well as the other murders that we've seen this week at the hands of firearms. People will see a significant increase in the number of police officers on the streets of Merseyside over the next coming days. We are being supported by officers from across the North West, including detectives. As you would expect, we all already do a tremendous amount to tackle gun crime with our partners, which has reduced significantly over the past two years. But this work with partners will continue, and I am meeting with our partners this afternoon across the region to discuss how we continue this work. Our investigation will rely heavily on information from the members of the public and I urge the local community who have any information who could help us to come forward so we can bring those who are responsible to justice. I also want to take the opportunity to appeal to members of the criminal fraternity and ask them to examine their consciences as they will have vital information that can help us. The killing of a nine-year-old child is an absolute tragedy and crosses every single boundary and I would urge them to do the right thing so we can put this person behind bars. I will now hand you over to Chief Superintendent Mark Kameen. Thank you Chief. Good afternoon. Uh, just a little more detail than the, that which has been provided by the Chief Constable thus far. As the Chief Constable just said, detectives are currently investigating this abhorrent murder of a nine-year-old child, Olivia pratt Corbell, in Dovecot last night. My intention now is just to go through a little bit more detail around what we know at this very early stage of the investigation. Following detectives working throughout this last night, uh, we now believe that around 10 p.m., two men were walking along Kingsheath Avenue from the direction of Finch Lane. 
at that time they were approached by a lone person, potentially a male, who was wearing a black padded jacket, a black balaclava with a peak, dark pants and black gloves. This individual was approximately five foot seven inch tall and of slim build and they were carrying a handgun. From what we now know from the review of some CCTV that we have acquired so far, we know that this person shot at the two men who were walking down Kings Heath Avenue. Both men responded by running away from that person with the firearm. Responding to the sounds of those gunshots, Olivia's mum, Cheryl, appears to have opened the door to her uh, property in order to see what was going on outside. One of the men, the man that the Chief Constable refers to as the 35-year-old man, appears to have seen the door opening and run towards the opening of that door. He has then forced his way into the property despite the very best efforts of Cheryl and has made his way inside. As that was taking place, the person with the gun has followed the male to this property. That person has also tried to force entry to the property and has managed, it would appear, to put their hand through the open door as Cheryl continued to try and close it. A shot has been fired, which we believe has hit Cheryl, injuring her and then fatally wounding Olivia. Olivia at that time, we believe, was stood directly behind Cheryl. Despite that horrific circumstances, the attacker has continued the assault and has continued to try and gain entry to the property and in doing so has then fired two further shots at the 35-year-old man who is at this point inside Cheryl and Olivia's home address. The attacker has then left the front door and has made off on foot. As the Chief Constable mentioned a few moments ago, a dark Audi coloured motor vehicle was then seen to arrive at Cheryl's home address and collect the 35 year old man who at that point uh, was wounded and at the front of the property. That vehicle we know then took the 35 year old male to hospital. I can confirm that that vehicle has now been seized. Cheryl was also taken to Aintree Hospital and she is being treated for a gunshot wound to her arm. Olivia was taken to Alder Hay Hospital and as the Chief Constable has already explained and as we know now, sadly succumbed to those injuries despite the very best efforts of medical staff, police officers at the scene and all the staff at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. I can reassure you and all the people listening and members of our community that we have an incredibly experienced team of detectives now engaged on this inquiry. They are going to be working tirelessly and we're doing last night throughout the evening around this investigation and we are absolutely committed to finding the person responsible and everybody connected with this offence as the Chief Constable has already uh, pointed out. To do that, I need the public's help. And unfortunately, this is not the first time I've made an appeal this week around a fatal homicide relating to firearms. Firstly, my appeal is to the person responsible for this horrendous attack on a nine-year-old school girl to recognise the pain and anguish that this has caused her family. I want that individual to hand themselves in. I also want the second man that was in the street that was with the 35 year old man to hand himself into us or make himself known to us. A general appeal now. The local communities I've said before earlier this week are, are absolute e eyes and ears of our intelligence and will help us solve this horrific crime. Therefore, I need them to work with us and provide to us any information at all regarding who is responsible, their current location, 
the whereabouts of the weapon that was used, or indeed any other information that provides us with a full understanding of what's taken place and allows us to successfully prosecute those responsible for this awful crime. I am interested, of course, in CCTV, and that could be from private CCTV at people's homes, or if you have it for your doorbells, or dash cam footage. We have launched a major incident portal on our website, and that information can be uploaded directly to us. I am also interested in any information or speculation that people hear. We know that names will be circulated in the communities very quickly around those that are responsible. I want to hear about those things. I also want to hear, even if you are in the area but you don't think you've heard or seen anything, let us be the judge of that. So if you are in that area or the surrounding community area, please make contact with us, speak to a detective and we will decide whether you have any vital information or not. I also want to know the whereabouts leading up to this attack of the black Audi motor vehicle that was used to convey the 35-year-old man to hospital. All the information that we do receive, as you can imagine, will be treated with absolute confidence. We'll do everything to protect those people who do come forward with information. If people feel that they can't provide that, then there is the option around Crime Stoppers, and the links are on our website, or the contact number is 0800 555 111. It is absolutely critical, as the Chief Constable has already mentioned, that this individual and everybody surrounding this crime is identified and swiftly brought to justice. They have no place in our communities. We have dealt with a number of previous violence-related homicides over this past week. And now we are faced with dealing with one of a nine-year-old child. Thank you. Thank you. That was Merseyside Police giving us that terrible, terrible update, appealing for help from uh, the public and naming the nine-year-old girl Olivia Corbell. You have been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. Up next, it's on the money, but first, it is your news. Good afternoon. It's just gone one o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Police have named a nine-year-old girl who was shot dead in her home in Liverpool last night as Olivia Corbell. Officers were called to a house in the Notty Ash area last night after reports that an unknown man fired a gun inside. The child was shot in the chest and later died in hospital. Two others, a man and a woman believed to be her mother, are in hospital with gunshot injuries. A record number of channel migrants have crossed the English Channel in a single day. Nearly 1,300 were detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of lorries also continues to be an ongoing problem. In the past year, official figures reveal around 8,000 people were detected at UK ports, having illegally crossed the Channel. Former President Donald Trump is asking a judge to halt the FBI's review of documents taken from his home earlier this month. He's now suing the Justice Department over its investigation into whether he mishandled classified material by taking documents from the White House after he left office. Local media says the US government collected more than 300 classified files from Mr Trump's home in Florida. His legal team is demanding that an independent lawyer is appointed to oversee the review. Industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director, Felipe Comerer, says half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January when energy prices could reach £4,600. Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak says he'll do all he can to support those that need it most. I cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn winter, and I know things are difficult, and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. 
Meanwhile, Liz Truss says she will put the West Midlands at the heart of her economic revival if she becomes Prime Minister. Ahead of the Conservative Party hustings in Birmingham tonight, Miss Truss revealed her plan to support businesses through lower taxes. She also pledged to deliver infrastructure projects, including the Midlands Rail Hub. Justice Secretary Dominic Raab is asked, accusing striking barristers of holding justice to ransom after they voted for industrial action. Members of the Criminal Bar Association in England and Wales will stage an indefinite and uninterrupted strike next month. They're demanding better pay and legal aid funding. The government offered a 15% pay increase, but the CBA says it only covers new cases and won't start immediately. While well, criminal barrister Zaid Ahmed told GB News it's just not good enough. I do it for justice, for, for, the, for those uh, uh, defendants and victims who come to court and who can have their say so that they can move on with their life. That's why I do it. I didn't come into this job to make money, uh, but I need to make money in order to survive and to be able to continue to do the job. And it's a shame that the, the Justice Secretary can't recognise that. More than a dozen EasyJet flights in and out of Gatwick Airport have been suddenly cancelled due to staff sickness. The airport says they called off 26 flights with most of the staff shortages happening in its air traffic control tower. Only hours earlier, the boss at Gatwick had reported that it was business as usual at the airport following months of strain. Meanwhile, thousands of short-haul British Airways flights are being cancelled between the end of October and March next year. Dozens of flights a day are already cancelled over the next two months. It's after Heathrow Airport extended its 100,000 daily passenger limit due to staff shortages and a lower-than-expected demand over the winter. And the number of deaths that occurred during some of the hottest days in July were higher than average than on any other day in the month. Official figures show a 7% increase in the number of deaths on a day which saw extremely hot weather. Figures peaked at 1,775 on the 19th of July, the day that Britain recorded temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius. You're watching GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now let's return to On The Money and Liam Halligan. And coming up on The Money today, wholesale European gas prices are soaring, rising 10% yesterday alone. On fears the Kremlin could impose a total block on Russian gas exports, and they're 45% up during August, as energy regulator Ofgem prepares to unveil the new, much higher, household energy price cap on Friday. On The Money examines what the government could and should do to help households and firms keep the lights on. Plus. The usually picturesque and cobbled streets of Edinburgh is currently strewn with rubbish as refuse workers reach day 12 of a month-long strike. And it couldn't come at a worse time with thousands of performers and tourists flocking to the city for the last week of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And from bin men to stevedores, dockers in Felixstowe are three days into their eight-day strike, with union bosses warning of more industrial action if demands aren't met for a 10% pay rise, GB News reporter Will Hollis joins us live from the Suffolk port. Plus, each day on The Money features an in-depth Money Talks interview. Today, we talk to Paul Ludlow. He's president of p and Cruises. He'll tell us why he thinks ferries are the future of leisure travel and how the cruise industry is recovering from the pandemic. That's later in the show. As ever, I want your questions, opinions, ideas. What do you think of the issues raised in today's On The Money? How do they impact you? Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. I'll read out some of your messages later in the show, so stay with us because this is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan and you're On The Money. Surging wholesale gas prices are putting the UK on a path to exceed 18% inflation next year, according to some city estimates. That would be the highest UK inflation rate since the late 1970s, with prices rising at their fastest rate in Western Europe. Now, barring a total reversal, the new Prime Minister, once this ridiculously drawn-out Tory leadership contest finally comes to an end in two weeks' time, will surely be Foreign Secretary Liz Truss. As energy prices spiral upward, the ever-rising cost of living is piling pressure on Truss and her team to address mounting public concern with an energy assistance package, not just for low-income households, but for others too. As the war in Ukraine drags on, it'll be six months tomorrow, 
The economic war between Russia and the West continues. Russia typically supplies around 40% of Western Europe's gas, but economic sanctions and Western restrictions imposed on Russian banks, that's stemming the flow of energy, pushing prices up. And now the Kremlin's threatening to close down that vital Nord Stream gas pipeline completely. Running between Russia and Germany, Nord Stream's a hugely important source of energy to Western Europe, not least as Russian gas pipelines crossing Warsaw and Ukraine are also not operational. On Monday, as fears swirl of a total Kremlin gas shutoff, European gas prices jumped 10% on wholesale markets. They reached €278 Euros per megawatt hour. That's a new record high. Wholesale gas prices have surged no less than 45% in August alone. Back in October last year, Ofgem set the energy price cap, which regulates average household fuel bills, at £1,277. The cap rose significantly, of course, to £1,970 in April, where it remains today. On Friday, the new cap for October will be unveiled, and soaring wholesale prices is driving predictions it could reach £3,500 or even more. And some in industry analysts say households should prepare for annual energy bills of £4,500 or higher from January when the cap is revised once again.